Hello, my name is Jim Colafello, and I'm the Vice Dean of Academic and Student Affairs at the Ira Fulton Schools of Engineering at Arizona State University. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our National Academy of Engineering Grand Challenges for Engineering Speaker Series, hosted by ASU and sponsored by the Kern Entrepreneurial Engineering Network. This engaging speaker series will focus on the 14 grand challenges for engineering in the 21st century. Esteemed speakers from across the nation will be sharing their expertise on these grand challenges and answering your questions. We are proud to be a part of the NAE Grand Challenge Scholars Program, preparing graduates to address these challenges. It's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Ramakrishna, the Director of the National Academy of Engineering Grand Challenge Scholars Program Network to share his welcome. Hello, my name is Ramakrishna and I am the Director of the National Academy of Engineering's Grand Challenge Scholars Program Network. The NAE Grand Challenges for Engineering, identified in 2008 by a committee of the National Academy of Engineering, are 14 critical global challenges for engineering in the 21st century, united by the mission of continuing life on the planet and making the world more sustainable, more healthy, more secure, and more joyful. The Grand Challenges Scholars Program, inspired by the NAE Grand Challenges, reflect the rapidly evolving nature of engineering education. The goal of the program is to prepare engineers who not only have the necessary technical skills, but also the cross-disciplinary knowledge, entrepreneurial spirit, the global multicultural perspective, and a sense of societal mission needed to meet the global grand challenges facing humankind in the 21st century. As of November 2018, 65 institutions across the US and around the world have implemented this innovative educational program, and nearly 100 are getting ready to join the consortium of GCSP schools. We at the National Academy of Engineering are thrilled that Arizona State University has taken the initiative to organize this series of presentations with, that will highlight each of the 14 NAE Grand Challenges and provide this valuable resource not only to its own students and faculty, but to students and faculty from around the world. On behalf of NAE, I'd like to thank ASU and the Kern Foundation for making the presentation series possible. I'm even eagerly looking forward to following how this series impacts and inspires the next generation to create solutions to our society's most daunting problems. Our best wishes for a successful series, and thank you very much. Hello, my name is Amy Trowbridge, and I'm the director of the Grand Challenge Scholars Program here at ASU and a senior lecturer in the IRA Fulton Schools of Engineering. I'm excited to welcome you all here. Um, thank you for coming to our second event in this series of the NAE Grand Challenges for Engineering Speaker Series. Tonight, we'll, have, um, we'll hear from Dr. Jeremy Guest, who will be speaking about the grand challenge of providing access to uh, providing global access to sanitation and clean water. Um, following the talk, we, you will have an opportunity um, in the audience, both live stream as well as live audience here at ASU, to submit questions. Um, and I will ask uh, Dr. Guest those questions along with a few of my own following his talk. Um, I'm excited um, to introduce uh, Dr. Jeremy Guest here today. Uh, Dr. Jeremy Guest is an assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. His research focuses on the development of technologies for sustainable water and sanitation with a focus on resource recovery from bodily excreta in technologically advanced and developing communities. Dr. Guest serves as the sustainable design lead for the Center for Advanced Bioenergy and Bioproducts Innovation funded by the US Department of Energy and the Environmental Sustainability um, Lead for the Soybean Innovation Lab funded by the US Agency for International Development. He is the recipient of a National Science Foundation Career Award, the 2016 recipient of the Paul L. Bush Award for Innovation in Applied Water Quality Research from the Water Research Foundation, and a Beckman Fellow of the Center for Advanced Study at UIUC. Um, let's see. 
Dr. Guest's formal training includes a BS and MS degree in civil engineering from Bucknell University and Virginia Tech, respectively, and a PhD in environmental engineering from the University of Michigan. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jeremy Guest. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm very excited to get to talk to you about uh, providing access to sanitation and safe and clean water. Uh, I'd like to start all my talks with acknowledgments. So uh, what I'm going to share today uh, reflects like a lot of uh, projects that we've worked on with my research group, and then especially uh, the folks in the bottom right here, um, three students from my group, Diana Byrne, Hannah Lohman, John Trimmer, and then our collaborator, Roland Cusick. Uh, so what I'm going to present today reflects many, many discussions with them, uh, which have influenced my perspective on this topic. So I want to start off with these 14 grand challenges. So you've already heard, you've had uh, one in this series that focused on restoring and improving urban infrastructure. What I want to talk about today is going to be related to restoring and improving urban infrastructure, but also providing access to clean water. That'll be the focus. It's related to managing the nitrogen cycle. And then we can also potentially talk about developing carbon sequestration methods in the Q&A and the role that wastewater management can play in that. Where I want to start off or focus is this providing access to clean water. And so this is a quote from the uh, Grand Challenges website. And what it says is the world's water supplies are facing new threats. Affordable, advanced technologies could make a difference for millions of people around the world. So I just want to start by fixing that. So that's billions. Uh, billions of people around the world uh, need access to improved water and sanitation. And technologies can be part of the solution for that. As we think about the role of engineering in these grand challenges, it's not just because they're difficult and we want to do better in engineering. Uh, it's also a societal need. And so we can look to the Sustainable Development Goals, which were established by uh, United Nations. And so these are they. Uh, so 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And in particular, you can see number six here uh, is clean water and sanitation. But what we're doing is related to many of these. And in particular, clean water and sanitation, we have a couple targets. 6.1 is to achieve safe and affordable drinking water for everyone. And 6.2, achieve access to sanitation and hygiene and end open defecation. So open defecation is when people have no bathroom facilities at all. And so they have to go out in the open. And so these are two targets we're going to be talking about today as we try and advance access to the water and sanitation. So Bill Gates made headlines in November uh, at the Gates Foundation Reinvented Toilet Expo when he shared the stage with a jar of human feces. So that's what that is uh, right there. And what he was trying to do was draw attention to the need for bodily waste management because it has tremendous implications for environmental degradation and human health. And if we look at the percent of the population with access to basic sanitation, this would be something that we are not accustomed to, but the most basic level of sanitation, some kind of facility that sequesters or holds onto the waste away from us, uh, there are large portions of the, the world that less than 50% have access to even basic services, a significant fraction of the world. So let's look at this another way. So if the world were 10 people, three would lack access to basic sanitation. That's 2.3 billion people. 892 million would open defecate. That's one in 10, or more than one in 10, really. Six would lack access to safely managed sanitation. That's 4.5 billion people. That means that for 4.5 billion people, they either don't have facilities or their waste doesn't go somewhere that it's managed properly. It creates environmental detriment or can be a health risk. 4.5 billion people, six out of 10. We look at the clean water side. So one in 10 would uh, lacks access to basic water services, it's over 800 million people. And three out of 10 would lack access to safely managed water. That means their water sources are not protected uh, in any way. And that's 2.1 billion people, billion people lack access to these services. The challenge is immense. And so when we think about what that means, it's not just about accessing safe water, accessing improved water. It's also about like, what this, this means for communities and individuals. And so of 61 countries, or across 61 countries, 8 out of 10 households where water is not accessible in the home, women and girls are responsible for getting it. And that can mean physical danger. It can also mean significant fractions of their time are securing water for the household and for the family. It can look different. It depends on where you are. In this one, this is in Ghana, and this is a hole that's right next to a village. And so kids have to climb down, get water, fill this bucket, and it gets holed up. When this dries up, 
she has to walk two kilometers down the road to another village where they have an open dam. It's just surface water. And so for over 260 million people, they spend over 30 minutes per trip trying to get access to water. And the consequences of that and this contaminated, these contaminated water sources are that or diarrheal disease, among other things, but in particular, diarrheal disease is the second leading cause of death in children under five, resulting in about 525,000. That's the estimate of deaths a year in kids under five. That's one per minute, one per minute in terms of uh, children under five dying because of diarrheal disease. And this is preventable. This is a preventable disease. So despite this need, this critical challenge, greater than 80% of countries that report suggest that they don't have enough money to hit their goals for water sanitation and hygiene. That's WASH, water sanitation and hygiene. They don't have enough money uh, to hit their goals. And so we can't find the money to improve access to water and sanitation the way we're currently doing it. If current trends continue, so if we continue to operate the way we have, rely on resources the way we have, agricultural needs, farming needs, uh, and low-income families sharing water sources and water continuing to be degraded and consumed at unsustainable levels, we're going to see 45% of global GDP, gross domestic product, roughly half the world's population, roughly 40% of grain production is going to be put at risk by 2050. And in particular, it's the poor and marginalized that are disproportionately affected. It's these communities that have limited access to safe water, that rely heavily on agriculture for income, but also subsistence agriculture, it means growing food to feed your family, and that they share these resources for all of these uses. It's their livelihood as well as being like their water, drinking water, cooking, washing, everything. And so sharing this water and the reliance on water is going to disproportionately impact these poor and low-income communities. When we think about improvements, on the drinking water side, we often think about boreholes. That's an example on the right here. So this is just drilled shaft down, and we pull water from the groundwater table up. And it can be protected, so you can try and put uh, concrete around it. And this dramatically increases the quality of the water that can be uh, accessed. In urban areas or peri-urban areas, it's often they try things like uh, taps, which are more distribution points for a piped network of water. And this is great. This can have tremendous health benefits. It provides people with a safer source of water, a protected source of water. Doesn't mean it's safe, but it's safer. The problem is, especially when we're thinking about that motivation, those 525,000 children a year, it's not just drinking water that's causing diarrheal disease. It's everything. And kids eat dirt. Like, they eat dirt. So I have two boys. They eat dirt uh, when they play outside. And the problem is, especially in low-income settings, they're surrounded by it. They're not only surrounded by it, so this is an a, a, a informal settlement or a slum in East Africa. They're surrounded by dirt that's contaminated with sewage, so with raw bodily waste, fecal sludge, with animals and their feces. And so the dirt the kids are eating is highly contaminated with pathogens. So this leads to stunting, diarrheal disease, inhibits cognitive development. It can have lasting consequences in addition to those acute ones like death. So as we think about trying to improve the conditions that these kids see, it needs more than just like drinking water points. We need holistic solutions that reduce their exposure to pathogens, reduce the contamination in the environment in which they live. One general approach to doing that is pit latrines. And so pit latrines are a way to help manage bodily waste and to sequester that waste. So this graphic in the upper left here, uh, this is basically what it is. It's a hole in the ground, and you put a slab over it, hopefully something secure over top, and people defecate and potentially urinate in that hole. The problem is with these facilities is that we rely on aid to put them in. They're installed, and the value that a latrine provides may not be uh, may not be the same uh, depending on who you ask. So if I ask a development agency or a non-governmental organization that installs latrines, the value is sanitation. So they've just provided a family with sanitation and access to a toilet. 
if you ask the end user or the stakeholder what value this latrine provides, it may be you gave them their only dry, above ground, locking room. They're going to store their grain in there. And so if it's a concrete slab, they don't have a concrete slab in their house. It's got a locking door. They can store things that are important to them. You want them to defecate in there? Absolutely not. That's not the value that this provides. So there's a mismatch in many cases. And because of that, because of also a lack of planning for maintenance and upkeep, and so we see latrines abandoned or falling apart. In, in many cases, let's say about 50% of the time, if you come back a year later, the latrine will either have been abandoned or never used for its intended purpose. Roughly half the time. And so this is incredibly inefficient when we think about development and investing and in trying to increase access to sanitation. There are those that are trying to change this. And so Gates Foundation is one group in particular that's been funding a lot of initiatives to try and re-envision what sanitation would look like in developing communities. We saw some of this at the Reinvent the Toilet Expo. But on the left here, this is an example, and in the center, an example of a reinvented toilet. So they funded the Reinvent the Toilet Challenge that pushed researchers and companies to come up with new ideas for what sanitation could look like. And these sanitation systems have to kill and activate pathogens. They have to actually treat the waste, not just sequester it the way pit latrines do. They have to make it safe. And they've scaled all the way up to, on the right here, that's the Omni processor that can work for greater than 100,000 people that they bring in fecal sludge and manage it. When we think about this new idea, so if we're willing to accept higher tech solutions or new solutions other than just pit latrines, other than just sequestering the waste, it creates a lot of opportunities for us. In particular, in these systems, they separate urine and fecal matter. And when you start to separate those, we start to be able to treat them differently and potentially recover resources. When I talk about recovering resources, this is basically what you all are to me. Uh, you eat food, and it contains carbon, water, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. You ingest it, and you excrete it back out. And there it winds up in the toilet, and we get it back. So for the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, your bodies are at steady state. And what that means is whatever comes in goes out. So we have those resources coming back out, and they make their way to the toilet. And in the US, for example, mostly centralized treatment systems. Or if you're in a rural area, some kind of septic system, probably. The opportunity here is in resource recovery. And what I mean by that is getting back the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the potassium. We can also talk about water and energy, but those are smaller in terms of their significance. But imagine that. Every, all the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium that you take in, we can get back. And we can potentially close the loop and put it back in agriculture. This is an opportunity. This is an opportunity for sanitation. We wanted to think about how significant could this be. And so we can start to think about the context in which we'd be trying to apply it. So the graph on the right here, uh, each point is a country. And these are data on improved sanitation coverage on the x-axis. And so we want to be at 100%. We're US and near 100%. US and many other industrialized countries are. And on the y-axis here, we have agricultural inputs. These are fertilizers. So nitrogen, P2O5, phosphorus, and uh, K2O, or potassium fertilizers. Consumption in kilograms per cultivatable hectare per year. So this is agricultural inputs. And what you can see from this graph is the places that lack sanitation, those on the left of the graph, are the places that lack agricultural inputs in most cases. These same countries that don't have access to sanitation, in many cases, don't have access to fertilizers. What that does is it leads to low yields and, and ag input limited agricultural production. So the picture on the left here, this is from Ghana, from some of our collaborators from the Soybean Innovation Lab. And this is an example of low input agriculture where it's mostly human labor that goes into the ag, very little chemical input, because it's expensive or they don't have access to it in the first place. So the places that need sanitation are often the places that need agricultural inputs. And as further emphasis to that, you can look at the shape of the dots, but this upside down triangle that's maroon means low food supply for, per capita. And those also tend to be on the left here. So it's an opportunity. This presents an opportunity. We wanted to think, OK, how big an opportunity? So I want to talk about impact. When I say impact, what we looked at is achieving the sustainable development goal of complete access to sanitation with resource recovery technologies. What would that mean? We did this all resource recovery. And then we looked at 
and that's in the numerator. And then we looked at projected consumption of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium fertilizers in 2030. And this is based on World Bank and, and FAO and other data sets. Here we're looking at how much can resource recovery influence the access to fertilizer. And I'm going to show you a color scale, so I'll show you a map, uh, global maps, and we have this color scale. So dark blue means if we look at fertilizer consumption in 2030, recovering resources won't move the needle like more than 2%, 0 to 2%. But if it's dark brown, it means it'll more than double access to that fertilizer in 2030. More than double access to nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium fertilizer. And in particular, I'm going to highlight the least developed countries. This is a UN designation, and those are the ones in green. When I look at nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium here, what you can see, for example, the US, dark blue. It's dark blue because we already use so much input, agriculture, so many agricultural inputs, so much nitrogen, so much phosphorus, so much potassium is already going into agriculture. The places that we have the greatest opportunity to change agricultural inputs are the places that lack access to sanitation. In particular, you see lots of areas of sub-Saharan Africa, some in Asia, some in South America. When we tally this up, we can move the needle. We can change access to nitrogen fertilizers, phosphorus fertilizers, potassium fertilizers at a global scale of about 10%. And in parentheses, this is part of an uncertainty analysis, so we're putting ranges on it. But in the least developed countries, nitrogen increased access by 65%, phosphorus 68%, potassium 150%. We can more than double access to potassium fertilizers in the least developed countries if we were to achieve sanitation and recover resources. So this, to us, is impactful. Not only that, there are opportunities to change the way we think about sanitation. And that's through things like container-based sanitation, where we start to take feces, take urine, and look at it as a resource or an opportunity to transform it or recover resources from that waste. And so this is a company in uh, Kenya, Sanergy, this is another piece that was done on, on work in, at a fecal sludge management plant in, in Rwanda, where it's, the, it's looked at as a business opportunity to manage waste and to recover resources so that it pays for the sanitation systems, that the recovery of resources can pay for the sanitation systems. That's where we're headed. As we think about achieving this goal, clean water and sanitation for all, we can't think about it without connecting it to the other sustainable development goals, like ending hunger, providing access to clean energy, sustainable communities, resource consumption, climate action. At the same time, we should be thinking about the fact that the World Bank estimates to achieve that was water and sanitation goals, we're talking about about $114 billion a year in investment needed. We're not going to hit that number with aid. We're not. And so I'm reminded of this quote. We had an alumnus in, from our program at Illinois who's been working in finance for development for 20 years. He came back to Illinois and gave a talk to our students. And one of the things he said was, there is no limit to the available capital for development. There's a strong business case and a manageable risk profile. You want to do development? Stop relying on aid. Make a business case. And if you can do that, there is no limit to the capital that's available. Because if somebody's going to get a return on that investment, they'll invest. So the more we can leverage resource recovery, other innovations to try and change the nature of how we think about water and sanitation in developing communities, the more resources we may have available. Where I'm going to leave you today uh, before our Q&A is with a quote from the back of the most recent synthesis report from the United Nations for Sustainable Development Goal 6. It says, the world is not on track to reach Sustainable Development Goal 6 on water and sanitation by the deadline set for 2030. Today, billions of people lack, act, lack safe water, sanitation, and hand washing facilities. Ecosystems and water sources are becoming more polluted, and funding for water and sanitation services is inadequate. In addition, governance and delivery systems are weak and fragmented. We're giving up already. Uh, the Millennium Development Goals were set in 2000 for 2015. We didn't meet the sanitation target. The Sustainable Development Goals were set in 2015 for 2030. We are four years in, with 11 years to go. And it sounds like we're giving up. What I hope for you is that we'll get as many engineers as possible thinking about these problems and getting in the game. So I look forward to the question and answer period. And with that, I'll stop. Thanks.
All right, thank you, Dr. Guest. Um, that was a great overview of many challenges related to sanitation, clean water, and access to resources throughout the world, which present great opportunities for engineers to develop solutions that create real value for society. I hope that all of you guys in the audience um, have, uh, have learned something new about the Grand Challenge and are inspired to learn more and take action in solving these challenges in the future. For the remainder of the time, we will give you, the audience, the opportunity to ask Dr. Guest questions about this Grand Challenge, his work, the field, or anything else that you're curious about. If you would like to ask Dr. Guest a question, please submit them now. If you're joining us live in the audience here, please submit your questions via text messaging to the number provided on the program, um, which is 505-552-2377. If you are watching remotely via live stream, please go ahead and add your questions as comments directly through YouTube. We'll do our best to answer as many of your questions as possible. Go ahead, Pixie. Yeah. All right. All right, while the audience is submitting their questions, I'll go ahead and get started with a few of my own. So in your talk, you described several important issues in sanitation and water that directly impact people's health and well-being. Um, the statistics are staggering, and although I'm sure we can all agree that these are all very important to address, the problems are very big and can be very overwhelming. So where do we start? As an expert in the field, what do you feel is most important for us to address? It is an immense challenge, and so I don't want to diminish that. But I think as a simple starting point is, is to reorient the mindset that we have about development. If I go to a development congress or, or conference, Often we think about aid agencies, they're talked about as donors. So even aid agencies that are trying to do investment in economies and help lift up like developing communities, they're thought about as, it's thought about as a donation, every mm -hmm. contribution that they make. I think we need to just abandon that mindset. It's, it's not getting us anywhere. Along those same lines, when we think about the tools that we've tried for decades to advance development like latrines, they're thought uh, they're often thought about is that they work. Mm -hmm. And so we need to reevaluate that definition of work. So I was at a summit in, in 2013, and I made some comments about the need to re-envision sanitation and recover some resources. And some pushback uh, from some of the attendees was, we know what works, latrines work. We need more latrines. And what I suggested is, I, have a, I must have a different definition of work, because <laughs> for me, if I install something and there's a 50% chance it has failed within a mm -hmm. year, that doesn't work. So it may sequester waste reasonably well. That's not enough. We should expect more of our sanitation systems. And same with our water systems. As a starting point, I would just enter development with being humble and respectful of the history of work that's been done mm -hmm. and the things that people have tried, but don't accept any kind of generalities or conclusions that there's a certain way things must be done or that innovation won't work just because you hear a few examples of it. Yeah. OK. So, don't, so don't, basically, don't assume something's going to work because it worked before. And don't, yeah. and don't stop with that definition and be OK with it. Yeah. Cool. Um, so what do you feel is most difficult about developing effective solutions to these challenges? Are, are the most pressing or challenging issues technical in nature? Or do you feel like they're cultural, political, economic? What, what, what do you think? There are certainly technical challenges. And, and one example of that is with the Gates Foundation systems, they think about how to develop technologies that can deal with urine and feces and things like that. And so, as with any researcher, let's say at an academic institution, you don't actually want to work with feces if you can avoid it. So they start with <laughs> synthetic or replacements and they try it, but then when they go to work with the real thing, it just fails miserably. Hmm. And so, there's a challenge there with, with working with the, the real systems, which are messy and, and vary tremendously from system to system, from day to day, from hour to hour. And yeah. So there are complexities there. Although some of that doesn't sound necessarily technical either. I mean, it might be also people being uncomfortable with it, right? Yeah. yeah. And any time, too, that we're interacting with, with human beings. So yeah. I'm an engineer, right? I don't like uh, looking people in the eye, let alone <laughs> uh, talking with them about their urine or their feces. Yes. But <laughs> that's definitely a challenge. But so working with human systems, they change their patterns. They, uh, you can have people visit for the day, and all of a sudden your sanitation system gets a different load. That's obviously mm -hmm. a, that's certainly an issue. At the same time, we think about this kind of decoupled methodology we use for innovation, which is somebody in a lab or a, a technological expert has an idea, and they try and develop that idea and then deploy it in, mm -hmm. in a community. It's, it's not at all different from what we as engineers have done for a very long time in civil and environmental engineering, 
you can think of it as announce and defend. It is that the engineers get together, they come up with a proposed solution, they announce it to the stakeholders, and then they defend it. That's, that's how it was done for a long time, mm -hmm. including in water and wastewater projects in the US. And that just doesn't work when you're as close as you will have to be to, to stakeholders who are going to use the technology or you're ch asking for behavior change and engagement. It requires engagement with stakeholders as mm -hmm. you define your constraints, as you think about what your objectives are, as you identify criteria for success, and work to develop solutions. You don't have to sacrifice everything about like innovation and engineering and using novel technologies, but you have to be you have to acknowledge that they're going to bring something to the table that mm -hmm. you need to learn from and account for in the development of your solution. Okay. Yeah. So taking more of a collaborative approach, even yeah. with people that may not have what you consider to be technical expertise, right. but with the stakeholders and customers involved. Right. All right. Let's see. So as you described, there's a lot of work being done in this area to develop and implement solutions to these challenges. So we'll talk about some of the solutions, such as the idea of resource recovery. Um, so when you described it at a high level, that our bodies are at steady state, this seems like a logical approach um, that has high potential to make a difference uh, in the area. Could you provide some additional examples of how this can be done, like what types of technologies are being used for resource recovery? At the most basic level, we can think about Fecal sludge has been used for some time in a lot of places in composting toilets. So mm -hmm. when the, let's say the feces goes into a chamber and you let it dry out for a long period of time, there's a very elegant solution out of India from Sulab International, for example, that they have a toilet that routes to one of two chambers below ground, and they just route it to one chamber for a year and then switch it to the other chamber for a year. And then the one chamber is left alone mm -hmm. and the waste space desiccates, dries out for a year. And then you can take it out, it looks and feels like soil. Hmm. And so you can recover fecal matter. So there are technologies like that in composting toilets that have done that for some time. More uh, kind of highly engineered approaches or, or looking for kind of products that people may be more willing to accept would be mm -hmm. something like a crystal fertilizer. And so then you, for example, can take urine and you can actually precipitate out things like struvite, which is mm -hmm. magnesium ammonium phosphate. And it looks like, a, like just a white powder fertilizer that you could potentially apply. So there are pathways to do that as well. Mm -hmm. And then we enter this space that you're either trying to develop a techni technical solution that can produce a target product that, mm -hmm. for which hopefully there will be a market and, and there's a need, and then making that technology work in a context versus trying to come up with a really simple solution that has a higher likelihood maybe of, of success on the technology side, but maybe a lower likelihood of acceptance. Mm -hmm. And that's a tension we don't navigate well. We're not trained to navigate that. The thought is either high-tech solutions, and you don't necessarily think about the stakeholders or end users mm -hmm. or the constraints in a, in, in a given context, or there's a push to do uh, it's appropriate technologies is the term, but this idea that you can only use locally sourced materials and local uh, engineering, local skill sets. And I don't think either of those are adequate. So okay. there's, there's a spectrum that you can use, everything from very little engineering and more understanding the system and what's available locally to a very highly engineered systems. I don't care so much if it's a technology. I don't care where it was engineered. I don't care where it was built. I care if it's deployable. So can mm -hmm. it get to where it needs to be and can it function? For an adequate time that's financially viable. That's okay. it can be manufactured anywhere. So so you have a lot of um, good examples there of, of kind of different technologies that have worked in different scenarios. How do you choose which one's going to work? Uh, I'm assuming it goes back to the customer and stakeholders, but <laughs> yeah, so it depends. Uh, when we think it's my favorite term, yeah. The, when we think about develop or recovering a resource in a given context, it's it's got to be engagement with with local stakeholders. But you can bring scientific knowledge or technical knowledge to the table. One example we think about is when we're recovering uh, resources or nutrients locally, we have to think about one, what crops are grown regionally and mm -hmm. what their nutrient demand is, but we also need to be thinking about the soil context. So what are the characteristics of that soil and what resources would be beneficial versus detrimental? And so the form we cover the resources in, it might increase or lower the pH, mm -hmm. and we need to consider that. But at the same time, we also need to be thinking about how to deploy a technology like this? Will it be accepted by farmers? Mm -hmm. And so there are things we don't necessarily think about, like in, in, in many countries, for example, uh, nitrogen-based fertilizers are subsidized. And so if your main value proposition is, I can get you access to a nitrogen-based mm -hmm. fertilizer that's derived from human bodily waste, and say, why would I want that? I have nitrogen-based fertilizer. 
Yeah. Or if somebody's growing soy, they don't need nitrogen-based fertilizer. They need, let's say, phosphorus might be limiting. Mm -hmm. And understanding that, working with stakeholders to not only to, to define the problem, but then innovate solutions is critical. Okay. So I bet a lot of the students in the audience, um, as well as faculty and others, um, you know, we hear a lot about customer-focused design. I'm sure that that's a very, um, very familiar concept to a lot of people. Um, how do you go about finding, like, getting that information from the customers? What does that take? Do you go observe? Do you go talk to the people? Um, what What are some approaches there? And I'm sure it depends. Also, <laughs> <laughs> we can we can stick with it depends. That's a good answer. We we have a particular recipe we look for when we work in developing communities. One is we always partner with a higher academic institution that's, that's in the country. And so I showed a photo there at the end with, with students from Mecca University in Uganda in Kampala. And we work with, with students as we go into the field and as we uh, think through deployment of our, a survey or whatever mm -hmm. field work we're going to be doing, and faculty there as well. That's, that's one piece of the puzzle. Another is that we, we work with non-governmental organizations that have a sustained presence in a community, NGOs. And in particular, we want those NGOs to be run and owned by locals. And there are lots hmm. of good international NGOs, too. I don't want to say anything disparaging about that. But just our preference is that, for example, when we work in Uganda, we, we like working with NGOs that are run by Ugandans mm -hmm. uh, and, it's, and, and staffed by Ugandans. Um, and so then when we go into a community, we want that NGO, yeah, to have a sustained presence in that community. And oftentimes, like one we work with now has been in the community we're working in for 18 years. Hmm. So they're known by the community, they're trusted by the community. Another piece of this is we hope that NGO has a portfolio of approaches that, isn't, that, that connects them not only with the end users and the stakeholders and the community leaders, but also all the way up to governance and understanding mm -hmm. how a city, for example, let's say Kampala, how the city authority is going to meet the needs of the population and what their difficulties are and challenges are. So we look for this group, and yeah. we've been very fortunate to find it in a couple places. But uh, we're looking for yeah, engagement and people who can be like forward thinking, are not mm -hmm. satisfied with the status quo, but also can offer tremendous local insight. Yeah. And it, there, I mean, there are plenty of examples of things like we wouldn't think about. Like we were in uh, Nairobi in, in Kenya. And wanted to propose a particular technology, and our NGO. So uh, we were interacting with this this group, Synergy, and uh, we proposed a particular type of mixer. And they said, "Well, to work with stainless steel, like there's nobody here who can even weld stainless steel. I would need hmm. to write a grant to get the training for someone to learn to weld wow. stainless steel before they could come and, yeah. and do it for us, so that we could fix this part if it breaks." Yeah. Uh, and that's something, we, of course, we don't, no, we don't we know, know or that. consider. <laughs> and so I think yeah. you know, having, having the right pieces in place, but in particular respecting that there is people have been making it work. Whatever the conditions yeah. they're in, they've been making it work for yeah. generations. And so being humble and walking into that mm -hmm. scenario, recognizing that you have a lot to learn about their context and how they navigate their day-to-day yeah. -day life. Yeah, sounds complicated, but it sounds like, um, you know, really understanding the network that's there, the different support structures and, and agents, or not agencies, but agents, I guess, um, that are kind of involved in it. All right, so I'm going to ask one more question before we jump into some audience questions. Um, so kind of going a different direction. Um, so let's talk about why you're here. So what inspired you? So why did you choose to study environmental engineering and get involved in the work you're doing now? I started in civil environmental engineering, so I have, a, I have two older brothers and an older sister, and, and the oldest, older brother closest to me, uh, when, I was, when I was 14, he was in college, and he was planning to be a professor of civil and environmental engineering. So when I entered high school, we filled out a little form, what are you going to be when you grow up? I said, professor of civil and environmental engineering. So I wanted to be just like my big brother. But when I went to college, I was sure I wanted to build bridges, so I was focused on, on structures. And that was all well and good. I, I liked it, but each problem seemed like it uh, for me, uh, there was a foregone conclusion. So if we were going to solve for the stress in a particular beam, stresses in a particular beam, there were one of three ways we could solve mm -hmm. it, and, and, and it was straightforward. I, when I took environmental, all of a sudden, like, it depends uh, came <laughs> up. And so we talk about what's happening in this water. Well, it depends. It depends on what the pH is. It depends on what the local like, soil and, and a subsurface is like. It depends if it's uh, connected with the atmosphere. But there's microbiology. There were physical and chemical processes all happening. And every water was different, and it, it just it, it blew my mind. So <laughs> I enjoyed that. And then as I progressed in environmental engineering, I took uh, environmental biotechnology, which is 
wastewater, like it's highly related to wastewater. And again, it was just very complicated. And we don't know what bugs are there. There can be lots of mm -hmm. microorganisms. And they all behave differently. And so I, I headed down that path. And when I went to grad school, so I went to grad school for environmental engineering, and, and I decided to do wastewater. And I was focused on that. And I was doing research on of incrementally improving U.S. wastewater treatment plants and their ability to handle a particular like type of upset event. And so I was doing experimental work on that. And I, w I did my master's, like as you mentioned in the intro, I did my master's at Virginia Tech. And while I was there, uh, April 16th, 2007, that's when there were, there were shootings at Virginia Tech. And a lot of graduate students and faculty and staff uh, from our program, uh, Environmental Water Resources Engineering, as well as others, were, were killed. And as I as the community tried to cope with that, uh, and we eventually started to try and go back to the labs and go back to our work, I just couldn't bring myself to take a pH measurement in a reactor, in my lab scale reactor, that I didn't see any like, meaning to. It wasn't actually changing anyone's life. There was no reason to measure this pH except for a paper. I just didn't care. And that was a really hard transition. So when I moved on with my research, for my PhD, and then when I started a faculty job, I just decided uh, there are two questions I always have to be able to answer. What is the problem and why is it important? What is the problem mm -hmm. we're trying to solve and why is it important? We start with that question for every research project we do. I won't work on a research project until, unless I believe in the answer to those two questions. What is the problem we're trying to solve and why is it important? And so when I started my faculty job, like, I decided like developing communities, impacting sanitation, mm -hmm. access to clean water, that was going to be a significant portion of our portfolio period because mm -hmm. I had the flexibility to do it. And I got to work with great students who are passionate about it. So. Great. Thank you for that. Um, definitely, um, I, I like the messaging there of um, kind of following your passion, making sure it's something that's important to you. All right, so we have some audience questions that came in. So we'll go ahead and shift gears over to um, the audience question. So the first one that came in is, uh, what is your perspective on the resource consumption of the animal agriculture industry? I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> Does that answer the question? <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, I think we should all be vegetarians. I think we can do that. Uh, but ultimately, it's, 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 not, it's not sustainable. It can't happen. So when we think about uh, resource efficiencies, like it, it, it makes no sense uh, to, to, <laughs> to grow agriculture, feed that to, to animals, uh, and then ultimately ingest that. So it, I think that as we look at especially developing communities and trying to improve diets. Uh, that's why like, I was excited to be a part of like, the Soybean Innovation Lab, which is mm -hmm. trying to increase soy protein <laughs> in diets uh, in developing communities. But um, yeah, I don't think it should exist. All right. <laughs> All right. This next one came from the live stream. So uh, what current business models or businesses are currently operating in these regions to solve these issues? It's a pretty big question. <laughs> there, there are a number of, of, of business models, but one of the ones I get most excited about is a service delivery model where sanitation can be provided or a toilet can be provided and, and this can be a number of ways. One that works in Nairobi reasonably well, for example, is that an individual or a business can pay for a, a, a toilet mm -hmm. and it's a, a franchise. They think of it as a franchise system, so they pay a monthly fee for this uh, toilet. And then they use uh, container-based sanitation. And what that means is people are going to the bathroom in, in containers. So mm -hmm. feces goes in one, urine goes in another. And as part of their fee, what they get is uh, the service of that waste being collected and new containers being put in okay. uh, every day. And as part of that, the responsibility of the franchisee is that it's clean, that there's sawdust to put on the fecal matter, there's mm -hmm. hand washing station and water and soap, and those all have to be provided. They have to be maintaining okay. the brand of the, of the toilet. And then the business owner can either, if they want, charge something for mm -hmm. it, if they want to charge a, a few cents or five cents or something like that to use it, or they can just make it available to their customers. And so they're okay. providing an extra service. Or they can just have it for their family or their friends, whatever they like. But then the, uh, the company has people on hand carts go and change out the waste. Hmm. They bring it back to a centralized facility and they can process it. And so okay. now we're not talking about an individual toilet and managing yeah. source-separated urine and fecal matter from one family. They've got three tons of fecal matter coming hmm. in a day and over a ton of urine coming in a day. That's a very different uh, opportunity. We can then design more high-tech systems mm -hmm. and do recovery of, of resources. I really like that model. And the, and the other pieces of this to make sure, because there's often a stigma associated with people who work in this industry, mm -hmm. especially in developing communities. 
And so they try and combat that with things like they provide uh, health care and vaccinations for their workers who are going out and collecting the waste. Hmm. And, That's interesting. and so they're trying to elevate their status and make mm -hmm. them uh, cognizant of the risks that they're facing, but also uh, more technical experts in the management okay. of the waste and providing health care. So that's one model yeah. uh, that I really like. Uh, yeah. There are others that we can think about how is this, uh, who's going to you know, basically take in the risk uh, and, and ultimately you know, reap the benefits of selling a product. Mm -hmm. So another model we're looking at now is we try and understand can we, can an aid agency for something, for example, that wants to subsidize fertilizers, what if we convince them to buy fertilizers from a toilet and we'll sell it at half cost? And if we do that, can that entirely subsidize the cost of hmm. the sanitation system? And, and we think there's room there to, to, to have that kind of model that uh, with, with aid money that's going, for example, into agriculture or, and in particular agricultural inputs, that you can get more agricultural inputs for the same amount of money mm -hmm. and money can be going to sanitation uh, to help make sure that people are living in less contaminated okay. environments. Those are, those are some interesting, interesting things that are going on. Um, so another question here we have from the audience. Um, how much responsibility should the government of these countries take for increasing infrastructure for proper water sanitation? <laughs> another hard, <laughs> it, hard opinion one there. <laughs> so, so it depends on how you define like responsibility. Yeah. But of, of course, these countries <laughs> want to provide like this service. If in, uh, in Kampala in Uganda, they have a, a Department of Preventive Health. And it's largely things about sanitation. How do they provide sanitation? But it's not, there are so many challenges that many of these communities are facing and such mm -hmm. limited resources that they're in a very difficult position. And so they need to be, they're often trying to think of solutions that go beyond like the US model for infrastructure, or yeah. European model for infrastructure. And it's, it's really difficult because mm -hmm. when we think about urban infrastructure, we think about water and sanitation. Uh, we can go back to 1800s and, and, and uh, sewage collection systems in London. Um, and these worked really well because for many of them, we did them a very long time ago yeah. when the cities were less developed. Mm -hmm. And we put, the, the engineers had the foresight to put in over-designed uh, pipes that have lasted 50, 80 years or longer. And, and they don't have to dig up the streets or the buildings to get, to get access to them again. Dig up the streets, really. Yeah. Um, so when we're thinking about what that looks like in, in a developing community, it's rare and or generally we will not recommend putting in underground infrastructure. That just, it, it won't make sense in, in most, in, in a lot of places. Is that due to cost or like yeah. difficulty of, okay. It, it would be tremendously expensive to do in the first place and then yeah. it's tremendously expensive to maintain. Okay. So even in the U.S., we are, yeah. our, our water and wastewater infrastructure gets grades of like D or D plus mm -hmm. from, from the American Society of Civil Engineers because basically the utilities are having to just wait for, in many cases, wait for water mains to break and then they fix them. Yeah. That's what they have to do. And sanitation systems, they can leak and, and we need to upgrade the centralized infrastructure, not just the collection networks. It's incredibly expensive to, to dig up pipes. So when we think about how to implement this, mm -hmm. there's not like one right answer. There's not, uh, we, even if there was the money there, in most cases, I don't think we'd recommend like doing exactly what we've done in, mm -hmm. in, in Europe, Southeast Asia, U.S., in, in, in most industrialized cities, there have to be new solutions. Mm -hmm. And so I think governments, uh, they want to provide this type of service. They, in, in most cases, or in, in, in all the, my experience so far, like they invest in this type of uh, work, but we need all hands on deck. It's a, mm -hmm. This solution is not obvious. If we had to solve this challenge in the U.S., I, not, I don't think we'd reach consensus either. Okay. So we'll do one last audience question here. Um, so do you prefer creating reusable water systems over these composting latrines? And if so, why? Composting latrines, so the location matters and the context matters. Composting latrines can be a elegant, like excellent solution in a lot of places. So if people are willing to accept that type of waste, if there's no access to electricity, uh, if the soils have low organic carbon content, there are lots of factors, but the composting toilet or latrine has a lot of advantages and mm -hmm. can, can increase agricultural yields and be an effective tool to also combat uh, pathogens, so to uh, inactivate pathogens if operated properly. In more like peri-urban or urban areas, mm -hmm. it generally probably won't make sense. Uh, then when we're talking about something like container-based sanitation where uh, 
we're collecting the waste and bringing it to a centralized location, we have a lot of opportunities and a lot of flexibility for how we manage that. If we're talking about fully decentralized systems, we're trying to achieve treatment. We, have, we also have to get out of the mindset of sequestration. So it's not just, mm -hmm. pit latrines aren't good enough. Uh, it's not just about holding on to the waste and try and not let it get out too quickly. But it's got to be about eliminating the pathogens, treating the wastewater. And so when we get to decentralized systems, that becomes increasingly complex, mm -hmm. especially for fecal sludge. Uh, urine, it's a, little, it's a little more straightforward. So when we think about what this is going to look like moving forward, I think... Uh, Composting latrines or, or things like that certainly have applications and could be a useful tool. In more peri-urban or urban areas, I think we're talking, we're talking more about collection and centralized treatment of the waste or uh, at least centralized treatment of the fecal sludge. Okay. I had a feeling the answer to that one probably included it, it depends, depends. Yeah. Uh, on the situation, um, but that was uh, but those were a lot lot more uh, more informative um, so, or answers than that. Um, so as we're getting uh, near the end here, um, I'd like to return to how you ended your talk um, with a call to action, uh, asking others to get involved, um, which I really liked. Um, so I'm sure that you have inspired some people here uh, today to take action. So how can students from engineering or other disciplines or others get involved? What can they do to contribute to addressing these big challenges that you described today? One, I, I, I look for opportunities to engage in, in this type of work and development. And, and I, there, there are opportunities both in, in student groups, but also NGOs, internships, lots of, lots of ways you could uh, find yourself, not even just in these communities, but engaged with groups that are trying to address the needs of these communities and work with these communities to come up with solutions. And as part of that, uh, I would learn to I'd do your best to learn, to like listen and adapt. Uh, to solving like open-ended complex problems. But one of the hardest things to do is to transition out of this mindset that I understand the fundamentals. Like, I am the expert. I can come up with a solution and tell you what you need to do. That, mm -hmm. is, that, that will not work. Uh, and there are so many examples of that failing miserably when somebody thinks they have a solution and they try and deploy it without ever consulting or engaging the stakeholders. Finding ways to engage with, in multidisciplinary teams, so actually working or finding ways to work with sociologists and uh, economists and people in natural resources and things outside of engineering has tremendous value. And part of that is just understanding to speak the same or learning to speak the same language. Mm -hmm. We don't. So one, the term sustainability means something very different to me than it does to my colleagues in those departments. So learning to work in those teams, learning to respect that people bring a lot to the table, including and especially the non-experts. So mm -hmm. especially the end users, uh, end users, the communities you will impact. They bring tremendous value to the table. And we wouldn't be doing this without them. So I try and find ways to open up like your mind, open up your experiences, get out of the engineering mm -hmm. building and engage uh, to the degree possible, uh, ready to learn. Great. I think that's some great advice um, for the students and others in the audience. So that's all the time we have for tonight's event. So please watch our website for future events in this NAE Grand Challenges speaker series. Um, our next event is actually going to be two weeks from today um, on Monday, March 11th, um, with Dr. Nate Siegel um, speaking about solar energy related challenges. Um, so please check our website um, and, and watch for that event and future events. Um, audience, please join me in thanking Dr. Guest again for a great, inspiring talk this evening. Mm -hmm.